Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a weekly show featuring interviews with fantastic authors sharing their personal stories on how and why they write. There's hints and tips for aspiring writers and great book reviews from top bloggers. Follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast. Right, cue the cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing. Grab yourself a drink. It's joined up writing. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 77 with CJ Tudor, author of stunning debut novel Chalkman, a book that's even garnered praise from Stephen King. It was lovely to chat to Caroline and inspiring to hear how perseverance paid off in the end, even as she was at the point of giving up on her quest for publication. There'll also be time for another trip to Book Bloggers Corner with show regular Victoria Goldman reviewing The Good Doctor of Warsaw by Elizabeth Gifford. Before we get started with Caroline's interview, I wanted to talk a little about the theme of perseverance and how it can relate to the actual writing of a book. It's been on my mind for some time and long-term listeners may remember that last November, riding a short-lived wave of self-belief after my interview with Joanna Penn, I stated I was going to independently publish my novel Safe Hands and I was even so bold as to put a date on it which was June 24th this year, 2018 as I record this. Well, there's a couple of things with that. Firstly, as I've hinted at recently, I've kind of cooled on the idea of going straight for the self-publishing option. I've got a really busy day job, like a lot of people, with irregular hours and a, and a family and everything else. And I think it'll take more time than I currently have for all the extra work it takes just to get the book out into the world. And I'm not talking about just uploading a PDF to Amazon. I'm hoping, you know, and hoping for the best. I'm a big fan of independent publishing, and I've been really lucky um, to have some great proponents of it on the show, including Rachel Amfler and Joanna Penn and last week's guest, Rebecca Bradley. But if you take one look at the products and sales that any of those writers are producing, you'll see the huge amount of time and effort that they put into them, including professional cover art, um, independent editing, promotion, SEO, formatting. The list goes on and on and on, and I'm certainly not ruling it out for the future, but at this stage in my career, I want to try the traditional route first. Secondly... Um, it was wildly ambitious. Uh, at the time, I honestly believed my first draft was pretty much finished and that the six months or so uh, that I had left would be plenty of time to get it edited. However, it turns out I hadn't nearly finished my first draft at all. I'd actually finished my zero draft, a draft so hideous its own mother wouldn't give it the time of the day. Um, so my first edit pass was actually a massive call of words. I mean, I'm mostly a pantser and my plot had just run off in lots of strange directions and it wasn't until I got to the end of the book that I realised loads of stuff in the final third in particular just had to go. The timeline wasn't right and one of the secondary characters was actually raised from the dead um, to, to, to be involved in the end of the, the book. So that, that wasn't going to work. So having cut many thousands of words, I then had to go and write lots of new stuff, which is what I've been doing for the past few months. It's going really well, and I'm finally within touching distance of telling the story that I want to tell. And then I can begin the real edit. But, and here's the thing, I don't regret setting that date or making it public because aside from a few ups and downs, I've actually been much more focused and productive since I made that rash announcement. Um, and I'm still using that date as a deadline to have a draft ready for my beta readers before that. And, on the advice of a writing friend, I'll be entering the novel in a competition that has a deadline actually before the end of May. And for that, I'll need to have polished my first three chapters and produce a synopsis. So that's where my focus now lies. So my advice is be brave, be bold and make rash statements, giving yourself a deadline and something to aim for. It doesn't matter if you don't quite hit it accountability will push you further and faster than you'd normally go. And finally, on that subject, and before we get to today's interview, I wanted to help a joined up writing listener who has also suffered at the hands of self-doubt and procrastination, like so many of us have, and that's Ingrid S. Perkins. Um, she can see the finish line with the writing of her novel, with the working title Don't Forgive Twice, and now just needs the extra push that 
you know that accountability that I've just talked about can often give and she's looking for beta readers as well so if tense thrillers are your thing you should go and check it out here's the blurb secrets can be dangerous an investigative journalist is found dead D.I. Aria Evans is assigned the case and soon finds her life in danger as past and present collide in a race to find the evidence and uncover the truth. Which sounds great. So Ingrid is making two proclamations. She'll be sending out her novel to beta readers on the 19th of May this year and you can request to be one of those beta readers by going to Ingrid's blog ingridsperkins.co.uk and you'll see a sidebar with all the details to help you do that. And Ingrid's second deadline is that her final draft will go out into the world on the 19th of October this year. That's 2018 as I record this. So make sure you head over to the blog or tweet Ingrid at isperkinsauthor to give her a little encouragement and I'll put that in the show notes as well. Good luck Ingrid and let us know how it goes. Okay, longer intro than usual but finally we can get to the main event and our chat with CJ Tudor or Caroline as she's called in real life. Caroline lives in Nottingham, England, with a partner and a three-year-old daughter. And over the years, she's worked as a copywriter, television presenter, voiceover artist, and, as you'll hear in our interview, a dog walker. Um, thanks to such a successful debut with Chalkman, she now writes full-time. It was a real pleasure to chat to her, and, if you listen carefully, there may even be a cameo from her puppy, Doris. Enjoy. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast, Caroline. Really appreciate you taking the time to do it. How's everything been going? Congratulations on such a successful debut. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's going well. Uh, it's, it's a strange thing. It's, it still feels very surreal, actually. Um, even, even though I've seen the book out there, I know there is a book. It exists. <laughs> it is on bookshelves in, in proper stores and everything. It still feels a little bit apart. It's, it's, it's kind of a strange feeling. So it's wonderful. But I still, whenever anyone tells me or tweets and says they've read the book, it's a bit like, R- really? <laughs> really? My, my book? <laughs> Honestly, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful but strange. I think perhaps when you've had a long time of writing without sort of getting anywhere, sort of 10 years plus, mm. and nobody's read your work, you know, mm. it's, it's a, it's still sometimes is a bit of a pinch me thing. You, you still almost like, it's, I, I, am I going to wake up and find this has all been some terrible thing? I'm actually lying in some coma somewhere <laughs> in some weird <laughs> alternate reality. Yeah. Like a plot but from no, one of your no, books. No, that, it's really good. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Well, for people that don't know, why don't you tell us, start off, just tell us about Chalkman and what, what, what it's about and kind of yes. what inspired you to write it. The Chalk Man is, um, well, I suppose the best way to describe it is a very dark, um, creepy, coming-of-age murder mystery. It's set um, in 2016 and in 1986. The ch- chapters alternate. Um, and 1986 is when we first meet 12-year-old Eddie um, and his gang of friends. And they invent a game um, over the course of one summer, amongst other things that happen to them, which is drawing these chalk men, these stick figures, on the ground around the small town where they live to pass secret messages between their gang. Um, and it starts off as quite an innocent childhood game. But then it takes a, a more sinister turn when these chalk men start to appear on their own at the scenes of various crimes around the town. And it culminates in the chalk men leading the group of friends to the body of a girl in the woods. Um, we rejoin Eddie 30 years later. He still lives in the in the same small town. He's working as a teacher. He has quite a quiet, ordinary life. He thinks the past is very much behind him, um, that the murderer has been caught. Uh, until one day he receives a letter in the post and the letter contains just two things, the drawing of a stick figure and a piece of chalk. And very soon Eddie realises that the game they started all those years ago is not at all over. It's just beginning, as they say in it's the trailers. It's just starting again, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've uh, well, I'll say I've read it. I've actually listened to it. I listened to it on Audible, and it, it's it's such a great story. It's as you say, it's really really creepy. You're incredibly lucky to have, well fortunate to have. You got um, is it Andrew? Andrew Scott yeah, and Andrew Asa, Scott and Asa, Asa Butterfield. Butterfield. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're, they're both both amazing. I was yeah so so thrilled to hear them read. I got to go down for some of the the recording of the audio book, oh, um, and it was just. The most, again, very surreal experience, sat there in the studio thinking, that's, that's Moriarty there, read, <laughs> reading my book. This is all very odd. But, yeah, he, he does he, – and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful job because um, Andrew Scott does imbue it with that kind of real lovely – well, it's kind of a weariness to the character of Ed, which I think is quite appropriate. But also there's that underlying kind of slightly creepy, sinister 
Tell there is, and, yeah. It's this, it's, it's, like you say, it's that world weary. There's, there's lots of. I mean, the other thing with it is that maybe people don't realise when they kind of first pick the book up is that there is lots and lots of humour in it. You know, it's dark, it's kind of dark, kind of cynical, yes. sarcastic humour. But there is there is lots of humour in it as well, and the characterizations is excellent. So, kind of what what you know, was there a specific thing that sparked this off for you? Did it start off as a st- short story or something else? How how did you come to write it? Um. It was actually, I mean, the idea came quite quickly. It was one of those very weird random ideas. Um, obviously, I've been, I've been writing for quite a long time and written various things. Um, and I actually almost got to the stage, I think, because I've got quite a few close but no cigars. I had an agent at one point in my, in my sort of few years ago, um, and that didn't quite work out. And I, I sort of got close with sort of runners up in competitions and all that sort of thing. It was always sort of very nearly getting somewhere, but not quite getting there. And I had sort of reached the point where I thought, well, maybe I know I can write, but maybe I'm just not going to get to that next level. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get that break and, and get published. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd kind of gone, well, you know, I've, I've, yeah, I'm 40, whatever. Um, I've got my little girl and, and I was running a dog walking business at the time. And, you know, maybe maybe that's enough. Maybe I'll just keep it as a hobby. Um, and then someone bought my little girl a box of chalks for her second birthday. It was mm-hmm. like a tub of coloured chalks. Mm-hmm. Um, and my little girl wanted to go out and draw on the driveway with them. So we went outside and we started drawing stick figures on the driveway. And she wanted to keep drawing these stick figures in different colours, doing different things. And we covered the driveway in chalk mm-hmm. drawings and then went inside and forgot about them, really. And then later that night, I opened the back door to let our dog out. And the security light came on. I was confronted by these just weird chalk drawings all over the driveway. And in the darkness, I actually sort of jumped. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. I forgot they were there. And it just looked really sinister and yeah. creepy in the dark. I actually turned and called to my partner and said, these chalk men look really <laughs> creepy in the dark. And I think there was that kind of ping of like, yeah, chalk light bulb moment. And yeah. there's just something quite creepy about that. Um, yeah, and I started writing it the next day. And actually, the book was called, um, all the time it was being submitted, and I, I sent it to agents. It was initially called The Chalk Men, yeah. not The Chalk Man. Uh, my agent, right right before we submitted it, the day before, in fact, we submitted it to publishers, um, said, hmm, do you know what? I think it should be The Chalk Man. And, of course, she was absolutely right. It works much better in the singular. Yeah, it is. It's really strong. I mean, I think it's such a good book. I don't think it would have mattered in the big scheme of things. But, yeah, I think you're right. It does. It just it gives it an extra kind of level of creepiness. Yeah, just that small anything. change, I think, really made made the title work a lot better. Yeah. And you mentioned your agent there. It's, it's Madeline Milburn, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah, because Madeline's yeah, she's... been on the show a long time ago. Uh, oh, was she? Yeah, she. Well, she remains the only agent that we've had on the show. But yeah, it was really oh, interesting right. to kind of get the other side of it. It was, yeah, about three years ago now. But um, yeah, so we got so so you you so you mentioned there. So you had, as you say, quite a few years of kind of, you know, toiling away and yes. trying to put things out there. So, I mean, how long have you been writing? like did you like to write when you were younger when did you kind of know that you wanted to to do this think, this thing writing I think I always wanted to write I remember as a little kid um and I think most people who write or become authors are the same I remember as a little kid I used to write stories and poems and make little makeshift books that I sort of you know glue together and things um and I always loved writing stories but I think again like a lot of people I, I had this idea that being an author was something very sort of very apart from sort of where I grew up and my background and everything yeah. that, you know, if you loved writing, you went into something that perhaps was to do with writing, but was, was a proper job such mm. as, I don't know, you might go and work as a journalist or something like that. Yeah. And so those were sort of my aspirations, I think. Um, but then I ended up basically not doing any of that because I left school at 16. So I didn't have a great time in my last few years at school and I, I sort of had enough of it all. So I didn't take any further education. I sort of I was quite lucky that I did fall into some jobs to do with writing. Mm-hmm. I actually managed to get a job on a local free newspaper and then I went to work in radio, writing radio adverts and, um, and that sort of thing. So I sort of stayed within writing. Um, but it wasn't quite really what I wanted to do. But I didn't I didn't properly knuckle down to try and write a book until my mid thirties. Mm-hmm. Um I had lots of ideas and I was great at starting things <laughs> and then I never oh, finished yeah. them. Yeah. Well that's yeah, um, that's a really that. common I'm actually gonna finish something this yeah. time. And the first thing I wrote was awful. 
it would a lot of people might write a wonderful first book the first thing I wrote was absolutely appalling but I was determined to finish it mm. and once I finished it I sort of went well, I can actually see something through to the end now let's just try and work on the quality side of this a bit absolutely more. and you're not the first person that's been on the show and said something very very similar and it's I, I completely relate to that as well I mean I don't think there's anybody that's written that you know the first when you say their first book you know everybody assumes their first book is the first book you know the first book that comes out or that's that's published that's it. yeah but it nine times out of ten it, it, it isn't and it, and even when it is it's you know it's being it's it's usually radically different from the from the first draft oh yeah i think there are there's there two groups of authors actually i was um talking i did a, a panel recently um with some other writers and everyone was slightly different. Um, and Joseph Knox, I don't know, you, you know of Joseph Knox, who wrote Sirens mm-hmm. and his new yeah, Smiley yeah. Man's out now. He talked about how he spent about eight years working on his first book, yeah. you know, constantly revising it and, and rewriting it and everything else. And obviously he had a full-time job as well. Mm-hmm. And I think, as I said, I, I took about 10 years to get something published. The difference was I was working on lots of various different ideas. I'd perhaps write something and it didn't work out or, you know, it, and so I kept sort of having different ideas. So I think you can sometimes find a writer who will just, you know, be dedicated to one project, but it will take them years. Or, you know, perhaps a writer like myself who, you know, if, if something isn't working, I, I give up. Mm. If it's really not working, I'm like, no, let's start something else. I've got another idea. Let's write that instead. Yeah. So, but, 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 you know, the, the fact is that it still takes sometimes a long time to get that, that break and get that first book out there. Absolutely. And I think, but the thing I think you say about finishing something, even if it doesn't work out great and it's, it's rubbish when you finish it or whatever. Um, I think there is a psychological thing, isn't there? It's like you, you just, you just break through that barrier. It's like, well, hang yeah. on a minute. Now I know I can finish something. So now I'm going to start something else safe in the knowledge that I can finish it if I want to. And, you know, I'll work a bit harder on this one and I'll try something different and hopefully I'll finish it. That's and it'll, it. Yeah. It'll I mean, be good. you're always trying to improve. Um, because it is quite, you know, daunting. I remember, you know, first thinking, God, now how how am I going to write, you know, three four hundred pages of of a story? Mm. Um, you know, I'm I'm a very impatient person. I like I like to get 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 to the end and get through stuff. Um, but but once you sort of get into, it, I think once you, I I tend to break things down into sort of scenes. I guess each chapter I see as a little as a scene. Mm-hmm. And once you sort of realise, you know, you've sort of got your 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 starting scenes in your middle, and 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 once you sort of break it down in sort of chunks, it becomes much more sort of manageable. But I think. I think it's a learning process and I don't think it's a process that you've stopped learning from. I don't think you, you ever get to a point perhaps where you, you, you're a writer and go, yeah. well, that's it. I've done that's that. Yeah. I'm, I'm per- perfect. I've written the, the perfect book. I can't, I, I can't get any this. You, you're yeah. always learning and, and hopefully improving. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you mentioned there breaking the book down into scenes and things like that. Obviously with your book, again, for people that don't know, just tell us a little bit about the structure, the way that you structured the book. I mean, you kind of touched on it because, you, as you say, it, it's set in 2016 and in the 80s as well. So, yes. again, was that something that, you know, you knew right from the get-go? You thought that you wanted to do that? And, and when you when you wrote it, did you think, OK, now I'm in 1980s mindset, so I'm just going to write all the 1980s stuff? Or was it very much you picked up the story as and when you needed to? I actually wrote all of the 1986 um, chapters first. Right. Um, I, I got all of those down. So I sort of had the 1986 story there. Well, in the first draft anyway. Mm. Um, and then I threaded in the 2016 chapters. Um, I did consider very briefly, not not, not for a long time, having it in, in like a part one and part two. Very mm. soon, I, I knew that wasn't going to work. Yeah. It was too disjointed. You yeah. had to kind of intertwine them. So, yes, yeah, so I wrote 1986 and then I started to alternate with 2016, which actually I think worked quite well because... I knew the characters as children then. I kind of knew what they'd gone through. Mm. I knew their story. So when it came to writing them as adults, it felt a lot easier to kind of drop that in. I felt sort of close to them already. I'd already already knew what had formed them, so to speak. Yeah, um, you've kind of yeah, you've written your backstory. I think, I think with that type of format, you're always going to have tweaking just to kind of make sure it all ties up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wrote a first draft of the book, and that was the first draft I submitted to, to Madeline, my agent, actually. Mm-hmm. And um, she ended up coming back with suggestions, and I I ended up completely rewriting the final third of the book actually. Right. So there's there's always a lot of tweaking that's that's involved. Like I say, I think you can you can think you finished a book, and actually you you, you haven't really. You can always yeah. go back. And do in the words of the else. carpenters, yeah. it's only just begun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think obviously the the technique of going between the the two different eras. I mean, one of the things that works really really well, especially in a book like yours, is the suspense aspect of it. Because as you say, you can choose your moments to yeah. you, you know you can go and now you know and then 
and then we're back it in the present. That, yeah, yeah. It gives you that, that break between. You can have kind of a cliffhanger in each yeah, kind exactly, of each yeah. time. Yeah. timeline yeah. and then a nice gap between you you go back to it so and, and i think that's perhaps the challenge actually of writing with with two timelines is that you want you want the reader to be invested in both you don't mm. want them to be rushing through one chapter to get back to the other one because that's more interesting exactly yeah. i think the challenge is to make sure you yeah you keep the reader's attention in both timelines so they're always eager to kind of oh god i want to know what happens in that one but yeah. oh god i've got to find out what happened in the other one as well so well it's interesting because you you kind of go one's going one timeline's going forwards and the other one's going backwards almost you're kind of meeting in it the middle almost, yes. because yeah. you can't you've got to decide what you can and can't reveal at certain times that's uh, right yeah so i should, should imagine that's you know that's a bit of a uh a melts your mind at times does it it wasn't. It wasn't too too difficult. But yeah, you do have to be like, oh no, he can't say that because he wouldn't know this, or, or we don't want him to reveal <laughs> yeah. that too soon. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not. I'm not a planner when it comes to writing. I know um, some people like to plan out all mm -hmm. their chapters, and scenes, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. Um, whereas I'm very much the opposite. I just I just write and, and see where it goes, mm -hmm. um, and then think, yes, I can just fix it all in the edit. It will be fine. I mean, I tend to make notes as I go along when I do that, which is like you know I will have to go back and change that bit there because yeah. I'm in a different direction. Um, but I think, but I, I find it interesting that way. I think sometimes ideas occur to you that wouldn't have if you tried to set it all out from the start, and you end, you end up taking quite interesting diversions. And I think all the sort of the, some of the, the twists and the reveals in the Chalk Man wouldn't have happened if i if i'd sat there and rigidly kept to some kind of plan because a lot of a lot of the the ideas came to me halfway through the book mm. so i i like that that sort of writing which it doesn't work for everyone it does perhaps work for every book and um, everybody writes in a different way but i like just to just to dive in and, and see where i end up that sense of discovery it's almost like you're discovering yeah, yeah, it at the same like time as the reader a journey with the characters and they're mm. sort of they're almost driving the story really mm. then so, so when you mentioned there, so you, you talked about, obviously you sent it off to uh, Madeline or Madeline's agency. So was that, with that, with the Chalkman, was that the first uh, agency that you sent it to or was that one of many? Did you send it out to quite a few at the time or was it, how did that happen? Um, I didn't send out very many at all, actually. I was, I was in sort of contact with, with another agent who I'd, I'd, been, I'd, I'd sort of been in touch with through the competition um, and a couple of others, so maybe four I think I got one rejection, another was interested, and I, and I was sort of in touch with this other agent anyway. But to be fair, Madeline was my first choice. Mm -hmm. um, so when she came back and was interested, it was pretty much like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this is good. Um, you just have a gut feeling sometimes. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, I, I, thought, I thought I'm not going to do a mass, a mass mail out. I'll just you know, take this in stages. Um, and I was lucky. And, and Madeline came back and, and loved the manuscript. And it, it, it was great because... And in a way, I hadn't expected it, I have to say, because um, I was kind of, I'd, I'd steeled myself for rejection, I think, <laughs> because mm. I'd been rejected a lot before. Mm -hmm. And because it's the typical writer's self-doubt, the minute you hit send and submit something, it's you rubbish. become <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. biggest pile of rubbish you've ever written in your entire life. And, and people will laugh at you when they read it. Mm. So you're like, right, they'll be rejected. It, it, it's rubbish. It's awful. I'll, I'll write something else. This one will be the one. Um but it was wonderful when she came back. And then, of course, we, I rewrote it and, and that took a couple of months and I submitted it to her again. And that was the scary one, actually, because, you know, I knew she was invested. Mm -hmm. and I knew I'd rewritten quite a lot of it. And it was like, oh, God, please don't let me have messed this up. Yeah. And when I got her email, I think it's about a week and a half later, I remember I didn't open it all day. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> it was like a you hear lots cat. of these stories. Like, yeah. If I don't open it, it could, it, it could be good news. It might not be bad news. It's both <laughs> and bad news. <laughs> So eventually, I think I opened it at about five o'clock and it was good news. And I, I did a lot of leaping around the living room at that. So oh, that's brilliant. Yes, that was great. So what? how did you feel when those first lot of edits came through? Because obviously, you, as you say, you, you already know that they're interested in it and they see the potential and they, you know, they've got all this experience and everything else. How did you feel about it when, when those initial edits came back? Um, not, um, sorry, excuse me. Um, it was okay, actually, because I think everything that was said, sometimes I think that a good agent or a good editor will say will echo the doubts you might have in your own mind sometimes mm -hmm. so all the suggestions were things that I was like yeah actually you're right you're mm -hmm. absolutely right um and then as soon as I came to sort of doing a rewrite it all kind of clicked into place and made perfect sense and I, I actually do enjoy the editing process I know some people don't like it but for me I think as a writer before you um you get anywhere you work in a bit of a vacuum and of course friends and family can mm -hmm. can read your work but it's not quite the same as getting a professional feedback mm. on something mm -hmm. um 
and I love that. I lap it up because it, it's wonderful to see how it can improve and, and shape a book. Um, because you get to a stage where you, you can't make something any better on your own. Mm-hmm. You, you're too close to it. You right, just can't. Yes. Um, so to get that feedback, and, and, and it sounds going to be a bit scary. It's a bit like, oh, they want me to do this. And that means I've got to change this and do the other. And, mm-hmm. But once you start doing it, it becomes a bit like a jigsaw, I suppose, in a way, changing bits and slotting bits in elsewhere. And I like to see how the structure changes and how it, how it improves things. So, so I actually really enjoy that. That's brilliant. So um, you, you mentioned there, so you were you had this dog walking business at the time and you were kind of looking at it almost as a, what, like a last roll of the die, would you say? Or I think it was a bit. I mean, I think with the chalk man, it, it very much was. Um, if this one doesn't get anywhere, because, because, you know, I was busy and time was short. Money was short. Time was short. Mm-hmm. I had my little girl as well, who was mm-hmm. a two at the time. So I was running the dog walking business. So I was out for several hours a day chasing dogs around muddy fields. And then in between looking after my little girl mm. and, and trying to fit in the writing around all of that. I, I remember when I was writing The Chalk Man once, trying to, I needed to finish this chapter. And I, I had to give my little girl a bath. And I remember sitting on the floor beside the bath with a laptop <laughs> on top of the toilet, basically. <laughs> so I could try and finish this while I gave her a bath. And, and I think you can only do that for so long sometimes before you kind of go, well, something has to give. Mm-hmm. And if this isn't going to go anywhere, maybe I'll keep it as a hobby, write some short stories and so on. But maybe accept that perhaps, you know, that, that that real push to get a book published, maybe it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, because as you say, you know, it, it, otherwise you, you're always, you, you, all your spare time, everything is taken up in it. And you have to perhaps give yourself a little bit of a break after a while. I mean, I, I've never stopped writing, but perhaps I would have, you know, no longer perhaps been writing sort of longer books, perhaps. I might have stuck to short fiction or just something and kept it more as a hobby. Because, yeah, because trying to find the time to do it was was tough. Um, and, you know, I had a lot on my plate. And the, the, the dog walking business, in a way, was really my, my plan B. It yeah. was like, you know, if, if, if the book stuff doesn't work out, I have, I have a good business. It's it, it's growing. I love, I love dogs. I enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the end of the world. And perhaps the fact that I didn't think it was the end of the world if, if this one got accepted was mm-hmm. perhaps a good thing. And that was maybe there was more of a relaxed thing behind it. Well, you often hear similar stories with actors going for auditions. And it tends to be that audition that they really didn't really care about or, you know, they just assumed that they were never going to get yeah. it anyway. That's the one they get because they just relax and they've got that kind of devil may care attitude about it. Perhaps that's it. And it, I think sometimes it's timing as well. I think, um, you know, there there is a degree of timing and there is a degree of luck with these things as well. Um, mm-hmm. The climate being right for a certain type of book. I was told for quite a long time that sort of the type of book I like to write which is not as you would call a straight crime procedural type of book I, I like to throw in a little bit of dark creepy stuff it's, it's not exactly supernatural but it's not straight crime yeah sure and I was told for a long time with when I had my previous agent that nobody no publishers were interested in that type of book at all they, you know, they didn't know where they would place it it was, it was not something that was anyone was interested in um, and yet when it came to submitting this time the climate was just more ready for that a little bit more open for something different so I think, yeah, timing and a degree of luck with these things as well. You know, one, one publisher told me when I was talking to him about books and saying, you know, there, there are lots of, you know, obviously lots of great writers who, who don't get that break. Mm-hmm. And as a publisher, even their job is to turn down brilliant books of course, because yeah. it's perhaps just not not right for that particular time or they mm-hmm. have another author who's using something similar or they, they just know how they would market it. So there's, there's so many things counting against you getting published in a way. Um, you know, I feel really, really lucky. Um, so, whoops, there's the dog. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think just, just writing something good is, is, is perhaps only a part of it as well. Mm-hmm. And, and when you got, you know, when you got taken on um, by the agency, did you, was one of the factors or was not necessarily one of the factors that have been taken on, obviously they believed in the book anyway, but did they ask you if you'd got something else in the pipeline or if you were working on another, uh, on another book? Was that factored into um, it at all? Yeah, I mean, we did talk about that. And I actually, I think um, very, very soon, I think perhaps when I submitted the full manuscript, I think I perhaps already sent them an outline of, of book two. Mm-hmm. and very soon sent the first three chapters because funny enough book two what is what is now book two I was actually writing before I wrote the chalk man mm-hmm. um, so I already had quite a lot of it written um so I was able to say look this this oh, is what I want great. to go back to um and so that's why the chalk man was sold in a two book deal mm-hmm. and quite a few of the publishers had actually seen the outline opening chapters of book two so they kind of knew you know where I was going and I think I think that did help actually in selling the book but it wasn't just going to be you know, one hit wonder. Um, well, hopefully, a hit anyway. It's but... not, well, yeah. I mean, it's often, it's often you often, yeah, you often hear that story. You know, you need to, 
you do, you know most people will say well you do already need to be a bit down the road with the next book or at least have a good idea of what it's going to be and to be able to say yeah, yeah. this is what what the next thing is going to be so are you i think, so, I think oh, sorry no go on i think it's understandable because quite a lot sometimes people will spend a lot a lot of time working on book one quite often years years you know I, I don't i haven't got that patience if, if i haven't written it in 10 months then. but i think it's reassuring for a publisher to perhaps know that it's, it's not going to be five or six years for the next book because you know at, at the end of the day they they want to keep momentum going of course um, yeah. so that, you know they want to have another book to put out next year and the year after that or at least you know every couple of years i guess mm -hmm. so you know, i can see that from their sort of point of view as well i mean and that, that's quite fortunate for me because i've always got loads of ideas my problem was always the fact that i didn't have enough time to write it all and, mm. and nobody was interested in them yeah. um and that's nice you know have the time and people people are interested OK, let's take a quick break there for this week's Book Bloggers Corner. And this week, Victoria Goldman brings us her review of The Good Doctor of Warsaw by Elizabeth Gifford. This is the BBC Book Bloggers Corner. Rather than my usual crime fiction review, this time I've gone for historical fiction and I'm reviewing The Good Doctor of Warsaw by Elizabeth Gifford. The blurb is a long one, so I won't read all of it, but it begins with You do not leave a sick child alone to face the dark, and you do not leave a child at a time like this. The Good Doctor of Warsaw is the true story of students Misha and Sophia, who fell in love and left Warsaw under Nazi occupation for a chance at freedom. Forced to return to the Warsaw Ghetto, they help Misha's mentor, Dr Janusz Korczak, care for the 200 children in his orphanage. Eventually, Misha and Sofia are torn apart, but hope to find each other again one day. Meanwhile, refusing to leave the children unprotected, Korczak and the children were deported together in August 1942 and murdered by the Nazis. I had already heard of Dr Korczak before I read The Good Doctor of Warsaw, having seen a brief mention of him in the book and film The Zookeeper's Wife by Diane Ackerman. My eldest son visited Poland earlier this year and learnt more about Korczak and his orphanage, visiting some key Holocaust locations in and around Warsaw. But while I knew a little about his story, the good doctor of Warsaw really brought him and the children he cared for to life. This is a true story written like fiction in easy-to-read prose and a dialogue, yet I can't describe this as an easy read. It's a powerful book, traumatic and heartbreaking in places, yet also uplifting and hopeful in others. A love story, not just between Misha and Sophia, but also between Korczak and the children that he refused to abandon. Dr Korczak was a teacher and writer, a doctor and educator, and director of the Warsaw Orphanage. When the orphanage was moved into the Warsaw Ghetto, he was determined that the children in his care would maintain their dignity and childhood. He tried to feed them and keep their spirits up. He may not have been the children's biological father, but he treated all of them as his own, putting his life at risk while trying to keep them safe and protecting them from the horrors of the Holocaust outside their doors, right until the bitter end. The Good Doctor of Warsaw is an important book, one that needs to be read widely, not just to remind us how quickly prejudice can escalate into genocide, but also as a legacy for the future. We are currently living through a period when Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism and all forms of racism are on the rise once more in Europe and within the UK, reminding many people of 1930s Germany. Reading this book and similar books ensure that we and future generations will never forget the worst of humanity and how easy it is to turn a blind eye. The Good Doctor of Warsaw is out now, published by Corvus Atlantic Books. Book Bloggers Corner. Thanks again to Victoria. And she blogs at Off the Shelf Books, which features reviews and interviews with authors, publishers, editors, and agents. And you can also find her on Twitter at Victoria Goldmar2. So be sure to tweet hello. OK, let's get back to my chat with CJ Tudor now, where I asked Caroline what it feels like to have an audience now, ready and waiting to read the next book. It's, it's, it's a nice feeling, actually, because I think there's 
But I mean, there's always a part of you that, that worries if you're any good or good enough. And I think even now I'm published, you read books sometimes by other authors saying, oh my goodness, that's such a good book. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm no good at all. <laughs> um, there's, there's always that feeling. And, that, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. It inspires mm. you to continue to improve. But of course, before you, you get anywhere, you, you're even more crippled by self-doubt because you're writing, I say, in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So you, you almost, you, you, you kind of have an idea that you think you're okay because you read a lot. So you, you compare yourself to books you read. But but you know, it's it's a part of you going. Maybe maybe I'm just no good at all. I don't know. Um, so it's lovely to think that you know you're not writing for for nobody. You're writing. You know, people are reading what you've written, which is amazing because you know you write because you want people to read of it. Course, you know, yeah, ideally, yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's been wonderful to have some fantastic comments about the chalk man. It it's it you know it's that dream dream come true thing. People read reading your work and, and enjoying it and, and telling you how much they've enjoyed it. And obviously not everybody will enjoy it. That is life. You're going to some people have some people who will hate it. You know, of course, it's, yeah. It's subjective anyway, isn't it? It's so subjective. Yeah, my partner and I don't like the same books. I can guarantee if I recommend a book to my partner, he'll be like, no, I didn't like that. I thought it was awful. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same with my wife, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. So when you actually, so you, you, you obviously got accepted by the agency and you mentioned there the two book deal. So tell me about the next bit because were you surprised? So obviously you, you did the edits that uh, the agency suggested and then you got to the point where right, well, now we're going to submit it to publishers. In your mind, in your best case scenario, what did you think was going to happen? What sort of time scales did you think you were going to be looking at? And how did you think, in your mind, how did you think that was going to pan out for you? And then tell us what actually happened. Well, I mean, I always, I always sort of look at the worst case scenario. I, I, I'm healthily pessimistic. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm not, you know, I'm not. Well, not you never, you I'm never, you never be disappointed, will you? That's the thing. That's it. I'm never disappointed then. So I think my agent had said to me, she had a list of publishers and, and ones that she thought would definitely be interested. And I think she said to expect to hear. And, well, she started to say in, in two to six, and I thought she was going to say two to six months. And she actually said two to six weeks. And I was like, oh, that's that's faster than I thought. Um, mm. And in my head, I thought it'll probably be six weeks. And at this big list, I'm sure there may just be, you know, perhaps one, hopefully, if I'm really lucky, one of these publishers will be interested um, and that was really, really all I hoped for. And there's part of me thinking, you know, telling myself to think, well, maybe none of them will be, you know, prepare yourself. Mm -hmm. I know my agent was saying, oh, I've been speaking to editors and they're all, you know, they're all very excited and interested in it. But again, you know, there's, there's that little voice in my head going, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yes, just they always that. say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, prepare for disappointment. Um, so, so I was, I, I was, I carried on with the dog walking. The, the book was submitted on a Friday. It was the beginning of September. Um, and I went about my business, um, my dog walking, and told myself not to think about it, really. Um, I remember that weekend, my partner was saying, well, just think somebody might be reading your book right now, <laughs> some you know, publishing person in London. And, yeah. and I was like, oh, no, no, I'm sure they haven't even got to it yet. It's probably on a huge stack of other stuff. Um, yeah. so let's, let's not think about it. Let's just put it out of our heads sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, and then so I submitted on a Friday, and I was out dog walking on the Monday, and my phone rang, and I – saw it was a London number. I mean, it went, oh, let me quickly answer this. <laughs> uh, and it was Madeline, my agent, and she said that they'd had uh, basically uh, their first, they'd had a preemptive offer already mm -hmm. uh, from from one of the publishers uh, for a two-book deal. And she told me what it was, and I, I sort of sat down. With, with I was going to ask you that. Did you, did you say that? Are you sitting <laughs> down? Yeah, Yeah, and it was a bit like, oh, grums. Uh, but then she was very much like, but... I know this publisher's interested in this one and this one and this one, and they're all, you know, already starting to make opening offers. So mm. we're not going to take that. Mm. Up to which I was a bit like, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so you not started off thinking, I wonder if anybody would take it. And very quickly it became like almost like a bidding war. It did. Then it, she said, we're going to go to auction, um, which was, was scary. Mm. Um, but it was, it was the strangest, I think it was three days the auction was over. It was the, the most surreal three days of my life. Because obviously I was just, again, just going about my everyday so how like, does that work? Does it is it literally you just get you you're fielding telephone calls essentially? No, I basically I think the, the way the auction worked with with ours was that everybody it started off I think with nine or ten publishers and they had to all put in an offer and then the lowest three got knocked out. I see. Then the next six put in an offer and then the, again the lowest three got knocked out and then I, I spoke to the final three publishers. I was just updated with what was happening. Right. Through my agent. Um, which was in the, in the meantime, the publishers were, were sending sort of their proposals for the book and marketing the book, et cetera, mm -hmm. which was again, a very strange experience because, you know, I, I was <laughs> there thinking, well, blimey, it was only a few months 
months ago that I would have, you know, this been beating whoever. down there. Yeah. <laughs> whoever. <laughs> yeah. me. And it was a very, very weird thing. And, and it was that dream come true. It was that as, as an author, as a writer, that, that experience that you could only perhaps dream of. Um, and it was a, a crazy week, um, but really wonderful. And then I spoke to the final three sort of um, editors from the final three publishers and, and, and had, to, had to choose really, which again was very strange. It was like... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Help <laughs> me. Yeah. I don't know. Madam said, remember, you're interviewing them, but I, I really was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, sort of, they told me stuff and then sort of said, so any questions? I was, no, 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 <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> when do I start? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, was, it was strange. But I felt a connection with um, Max, who is my editor now, um, at Penguin, Michael Joseph, um, mm -hmm. straight away. Everybody was lovely. Um, but I think... We, we had a connection. We talked about toddler poo, and, and that was it, really. That's always <laughs> – you hear that story so often. <laughs> it's nothing to do with the book. We talked about toddlers and, and <laughs> habits, and I thought, yes, this is the editor for me. <laughs> she yeah. gets – She got you, yeah. Well, that's, that's brilliant. It must have been so exciting at the time. As you say, it's a bit surreal, but – It was life-changing. It, it was actually completely life-changing, that sort of – week and and you know wonderful things when you've been trying for a long time and you know i'm no spring chicken to kind of have that um that that feeling of like you know it is it is all worthwhile i used, I used to say jokingly when i was dog walking into friends and people um about stuff oh you know one day when i'm a best-selling author very much in a del boy sort of, one yeah, day, yeah, yeah. sort of way and it was a weird thing to go blind me i am going to be an author I, I have i'm going to get a book published this is this is uh, this is going to happen. So it was it was wonderful, but but yeah, it abs and, and life changing. Like life has changed completely since that week. Absolutely. Well, it's a really really inspiring story for anybody. As you say, you've already had. I mean, it's been what's it been about three months since it's been published now? As we record this, yeah, it's January been the eighteenth or something. Yeah, eleventh January the eleventh in the UK. I think yeah. Um, and obviously, it's had it's already having uh, you know it's had great reviews. You've as you say, you've got. A really, uh, Holly, well, not Hollywood cast, but pretty pretty high ranking cast on the Audible book and everything as well. And you also had some great feedback from somebody that we're going to mention in the epilogue in the little bonus question. But you also got a tweet <laughs> from Stephen King, which we'll mention a little bit later. Indeed. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's so it's obviously been so a bit a fairy tale in a way. Yeah, it has. It's it 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 really is. I mean, I, I, whenever people. I, I can't really, it's getting, I don't want to sound horribly smug, um, but it, it, it <laughs> really allowed. has been. There's been no downsides. Um, I think you know, some people say well, writing is hard work. And well, yes, it, it can, it is in a degree and, and you can get stuck on stuff. And I mean, I'm in, again, an incredibly privileged position that because again, that was the other crazy thing that the short man sold in, in so many other countries, mm. uh, which again was something I hadn't considered. I, I just thought publisher UK, wow, that'd yeah. be amazing. Maybe America, that would also be amazing. But I hadn't, because it would then go on to sell in, in you know, almost 40 countries, which was just insane. Mm. And, and obviously, it, it's nice. I've, I've got asked to visit some of those publishers, some of those countries for various events so far. So there is that side of stuff that, that you don't think of when writing a book, that actually, even if it's just in the UK, there's, there's a lot of promotional stuff and there's traveling. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I've been traveling to other countries too. And all that's quite busy juggling with a little girl and, and everything. But I would never moan about it because it's also a wonderful privilege to be asked to do all those things. Um, and the writing itself, you know, to, to be able to write full time, it still feels a bit like some kind of guilty pleasure to go and sit in a coffee shop and just write. Well, of course, yeah. But I mean, as it's well. It's not a proper job. But... No, but, you know, as you as you say, it, it's easy for people to that maybe come to the story late and they see that's the thing that they see, you know, debut novel, uh, you know, sells all around the world and all this kind of thing and you, you have this bidding war and all that but you know it's one of those cases of it's it's at least a 10-year overnight success story isn't it you know there's it is, all, yeah. all the work that went into it before that and as you said you were almost you know at the end of not your end of your tether with it because obviously you still love writing but in terms of pursuing it as a career and trying to get your book published you were starting to think well you know maybe I'll I'll just treat it as a hobby and I won't yeah, or submitting anything again. Absolutely. I mean, because I say I was I'm 46 now, so you know, it, it it's it's not as if you know I was sort of as I say it's it's taken a long while. I, I didn't sort of knuckle down till quite late. And you do reach a point where you go, well, perhaps you know maybe it is time to just go. Okay, that's enough. Call it a day. You might be good, but perhaps you're just not good enough. 
Um, and there's no shame in admitting that with things sometimes. And and I do I do you know feel that it was it was amazing that a lot of things perhaps just fell into place. Um, and you know it it turned out it went the other way, which is great. And you know I'm very very thankful to my friends Claire and Matt for buying that tub of coloured chalk. <laughs> they yeah. have got acknowledgement at the back of the book. They're not getting any royalties, but they've got an acknowledgement. <laughs> Oh, no, it's brilliant. And if there's anybody out there that's listening, you know, hopefully that they'll be thinking the same thing. You know, if they're maybe thinking that they're coming to the end of the line and they've they've submitted over and over and over again, it just shows you that it's worth seeing the project. You know, your current yeah, work your progress absolutely. through to the end and giving it one one last shot or or whatever. Um, it is. I mean, I I suppose I, I always say actually don't give up. And perhaps I I had been been thinking of you know let's let's give up to a degree. I would never have stopped writing. No. But, you know, I certainly think, you know, it's, it's it don't don't feel disheartened by, you know, a few rejections or if you haven't got somewhere over after, you know, two or three years or, or or whatever. Because, you know, there's there's always perhaps another idea. You know, do keep at it. Um but also listen to feedback as well. I think if you're lucky enough to get feedback from agents or or, or even publishers. Mm-hmm. Um I don't I, I always say to people don't hang on to an idea if it's not working. Mm-hmm. I think some people hang on to one book, one idea. Um, but I think if you're told enough times that this isn't, this isn't the one, this isn't right for these reasons, do take that on board. You know, maybe it will be the one further down the line, but put it away and, and, and just go crack on with something else. Um, I, I don't believe in just hanging on to one idea or one book. I think sometimes if something isn't working, you do have to know when to put something to one side as well and perhaps start something afresh. Absolutely, that's really good advice. So, so what's up next? You've kind of alluded to that second book. How much can you say about that so far? And can you give us an idea of when we might get to get hands on that? Yes. Well, it's finished. I mean, I'm just actually working through the copy edits on book two at the moment. So it is all finished. Um, I don't think I'm quite allowed to say the title yet. We, we had, funny enough, the writing of book two wasn't much of a problem. I know some people say, oh, difficult book two. <laughs> but I, I didn't find that a problem in itself. We have had a bit of a wrestle over the title. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. So I think we finally agreed on a title for book two, but I don't, I don't think I'm allowed to say what it Still is yet. Still under embargo. I, I might, yes, I think it is at the moment. Um, so, but, but it, if I think if people like the Chalk Man, um, it's, it's uh, obviously the Chalk Man is a standalone book, um, and book two is a standalone story with a different set of characters. It takes place in a small ex mining village um, in Nottinghamshire. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's another very dark, creepy tale about a character who is returning to this village where he grew up uh, for various reasons. Um, one of them is that there's a that there's a series of events that occurred in his childhood and something quite nasty and dramatic has happened in the present day. A mother, for no apparent reason, has just suddenly bludgeoned her 11-year-old son to death, um, just for no apparent reason out of the blue. Um and there's a lot of dark secrets, um, a lot of creepiness um, going on in it. I think my my editor described it as sharing the same DNA as the Chalk Man. Mm-hmm. So if you enjoyed the Chalk Man, I think you will sort of enjoy this story as well. Um, I think I think it's actually creepier than the Chalk Man. Yeah, uh, well that sounds, it, it sounds pretty dark, dark from yeah from what you've said so far. Still. But it's yeah. it's got it's got a lot of similar elements, but being a very different story that I think stands on its own too. I think that's always the thing with book two. You you, you tread that fine line between if, you, if it's too close to the original, to, to your first book, people will always be, well, they're just doing the same thing again. Yeah, and if it's difficult. too different, people will be like, well, I, don't, I like the first book. I don't know why they've had to well, do something so yeah. different. And I think the thing with it <laughs> now is... Damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I, yeah. I hope you think it walks that line and, 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 and walks it okay. It doesn't, doesn't fall off the high wire. I think it's refreshing actually to hear somebody that's just starting out in terms of the, their publishing career and it in it, it it does it isn't an, a series you know it's two standalones yes uh, because at the moment it does feel feel like you know people get published and it's usually on the back of well that you know there's a series in this you know with there's, there's yes. at least three four five however many novels <laughs> with the same characters or the same world or whatever so um you know and it's easy to forget that it wasn't always like that <laughs> you know we I may- know it's a strange thing yeah. actually isn't it it does happen much more now and I don't know whether that's because but there's probably some research about it that there often is about these things mm. about people being more inclined to stay with I think it's the box yeah, I think it's the box set kind of mentality I spoke to Perhaps it is. previous guests about it I think it's a similar sort of thing I think I know and don't get me wrong I, I just the same as anybody else I find a series that I like and you know I want to devour all of it and 
you know read all the different ones or whatever but i do i think there are certain authors you know look mentioned stephen king there you know he's a good example of you know you like his voice you like reading what he does even though he writes in multiple genres and everything else you just you just want books it. are different as well yeah. i think we, we we do a little bit tie up books well it seems like every book now has to be you know developed into a television series or, or a film or something um yeah. and i think people sort of eye books a little bit more like that as in you know if it's a series we can make a television series out of it if it's a series of books with the same character mm -hmm. um but books for me when i certainly started reading i'm a huge stephen king fan mm -hmm. i was more used to books being each one perhaps being a standalone story mm. um, and i quite i quite like that. I, I like books that, that do have the same characters as well that, that you know that has benefits too mm. for me writing i think it's 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 more fun to yeah. have different set of characters to play with each time mm. i think i might get bored if i just had the one character to play with each time and and then you, you've got in in a way sometimes a harder challenge because you've got to find ways of making each new situation interesting to put them in without it becoming ridiculous i think so yeah i think i see it as more of a challenge yeah um, uh, but whereas if you've got a new book each time you've got a whole different setting a whole new set of characters you just have a whole freedom of this whole new world again yeah, um, so I have said, it is it is it's more fun to play with though i like to think that all my because I've books three and four, I kind of already know what I'm doing with them, so I'm quite away on with book three. Mm -hmm. Again, a standalone, but I like to think they all exist in the same sandbox. Yeah, yeah. There are little references to to, to other books within oh, I books like three. That. That's good. Yeah, and I think readers so if, like if that. They're in the same universe. I think little, little like. Easter eggs. Yeah, to find. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so um, just as we wrap things up, so where can people find you online, Caroline? Oh, well, they can find me uh, at Twitter, at CJ Tudor. Mm -hmm. um, I believe I have a Facebook page as well. Um, I think it's CJ Tudor official, facebook.com. Okay, brilliant. Um, I, I see I'm not so hot on Facebook. I told you I'm completely untechnical. Well, but I am on Twitter not, a lot. I, yeah. tend, I tend to tweet more than I do anything. Yeah, so I'm if people want to want to follow me or, or say hi on Twitter, you can always find me on Twitter. And I always I always reply back. It's where the but cool, it's the same nice things, obviously. It's where, yeah, it's where the cool kids are. <laughs> or, or as my teenage daughter tells me, it's where the old people are. So, you know. You Is have it? To, so apparently, <laughs> apparently. But I, I find that that's where the best conversations are. So I, I, I like Twitter. I thought I was really with it being on Twitter, you see. But, but apparently, you know, I'm, I'm already... I've apparently. No, no, apparently I'm not. No, I'm way, I'm way past that. So, uh, well, that's great. Well, I'll put all that in the show notes. And um, for the time being, anyway, Caroline, thanks a million for coming on the show. And it's been great to talk that's to you. Fun. Okay, thanks again to Caroline. And I highly recommend you check out The Chalk Man. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That wraps things up for another week. But don't forget, you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. You can make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcast to have the show downloaded automatically every week. Also remember to get in touch with all your writing news, views, questions or comments and tweet me with where you're listening and why you enjoy the show and I'll give you a mention in a future show. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading and I'll see you next time.